All right, it's the top of the hour. Let's begin. Let me welcome everyone. Let me welcome you to the Future Transform. I'm very, very glad to see some of you here. We have a terrific guest and a very, very important topic. But before we get started with that, let me just give you a quick intro to the forum and the technology so you can see what we do, how it works, and where we're headed. So to begin with, you should know the forum is a discussion-based place. This is where we have conversations about the future of education. What I'm doing right now is showing you a couple of slides. We'll stop in just a minute. The goal here is to have as much discussion between people as possible. Now, this is one part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. And that's an ongoing multimodal, multimedia participatory attempt to grapple with higher education's future. That includes a forum. It also includes a monthly FTTE report which looks at major trends. It also includes uh, a very active blog. It includes a book club, and it includes a lot more besides that. So if you're new to it, just check out futureofeducation.us to learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the support of some generous supporters, and, and we'd like to thank them before we proceed. To begin with, I'd like to thank NizerNet in New York State. Uh, it's a nonprofit that does great work with broadband networks, helping that state's colleges and universities connect to each other. They also do great professional development work, and we're really grateful to them for their support. Well, we're also grateful to Shindig, uh, our technology provider, who makes available this platform we're using now. So if you're new to it, or if you haven't seen it for a while, let me just walk you through how to use this to participate in our conversation. To begin with, where I am right now, where the slide is, again, just for a minute, is called the stage. And we call it that because everyone involved in this conversation can see and hear everything that goes on on stage. And this is where our guest is going to be in just a minute. And this is where you can be. And I'll show you how to do that. Right below us, you'll see a bunch of different people, maybe 20, maybe 12, depending on where you are, each represented by either an image or like a, or a, a silhouette, like Mark Gage, or a video feed, like Tom Haynes. And each of those represents one or more people signing in from somewhere in the world. Uh, I think of that as the participant swarm. And you'll see people there move back and forth as they go. And if you're interested in those people, or an individual in particular, you can double click on them and see if you can have a video chat privately, which is pretty neat. But about that conversation, look at the bottom of your screen. If you're, on a, if you're on a laptop or a desktop, you should see a white strip running along it with a few different buttons. The leftmost edge will be a button for a chat box. So you can click that, and up will be a chat box with everybody involved in this conversation. So just before we go further, can you just enter that chat box and just type in who you are and where on earth you're coming from today geographically? I was just saying that I wanted to thank our supporters on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site which lets people support a creative project. In this case, it's supporting the Future of Education Observatory. So people contribute as little as a dollar a month to keep the machines running, and we're, which is awesome. And some of them contribute more. People on this slide contribute $10 a month uh, to keep the machines going. People like Fritz Vandover, Matthew P. Henry, William Boucher, Francine Hibiscus, Colleen Carmine, Hugh Blackmer, Kristen Eshelman, Melissa Wu. We're really grateful for them. And you can join them if you like. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. And one last note, uh, a little bit of self-promotion. Uh, my new book is out. It's in stores called Academia Next on the futures of higher education. Uh, it relies a lot on the kind of work we've been doing here for the past four years. And uh, sales have been good. If you'd like to join them, just pick it up from Amazon or Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, but we really, we'd be very glad uh, if, you can, uh, if you can support us. And let us know what you think of the book. So now, that's all by way of introduction. Let me introduce this week's guest. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to bring in Richard Baranek. Uh, Richard is the founder and director of OpenStax at Rice University in Texas. Uh, this is one of the leading open education research projects out there. Uh, it's a very, very important project, and we're really fortunate to have its presiding genius with us today. Richard, welcome. Uh, great to be here. Well, I'm just I'm really, really glad to see you. Um, tell, tell us, just for the sake of... Um, American winter. Uh, how cold is it down there in Texas right now? It's actually a, uh, what do we have here? It's unfortunately a bit gray and cool uh, in Houston, about uh, 50 degrees, and it should be clear and sunny and 70, but can't win them all. 50, wow, oh, that's rough. Well, um, 
listen, I, I have so many questions to ask you, and I know our participants will have so many questions as well. Uh, but just to begin with, let, let me just start you going as a way of introducing yourselves to people. For the rest of 2020, for the calendar year, what are the big issues and projects you're going to be working on? Ah, so ar around OpenStax? Um, first, yourself. Oh, I have to clean my pantry. <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> so that's a job. Uh, you probably get some volunteers to help you with. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is a great. Uh, we're, 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 I'm very excited about 2020. Uh, we're going to, on the OpenStack side of things. We're going to be uh, launching some uh, uh, significantly growing our library. Mm. We're currently at about 40 books. We're going to be announcing some initiatives to uh, greatly increase that size in some really exciting subject areas. So that's one uh, area very uh, uh, excited about is just providing more high quality educational content to the people who need it most, nice. students in this country. And then the second thing that I'm very excited about is uh, continuing to grow the uh, learning science aspects mm -hmm. around OpenStax mm -hmm. uh, using the you know, data that we're collecting, ex uh, studies that we're conducting with instructors and school districts around the country to be able to really learn more about how people learn. Because our ultimate goal is to build not uh, any old textbook, but build an intelligent textbooks. Mm. Mm. So not just a PDF flat out. Exactly. Right? A book that would learn about you at just as you're learning from it. Um, well, that's great. I'm glad to hear that uh, that's going to be worked on. Let me just say, friends, I have lots of questions uh, for Richard, but this forum is here for you. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions. Uh, so as we go, uh, please chime in. If you've used OpenStax textbooks or you're considering using them, if you're interested in OER from everything from how to finance it to how to get it adopted to how to make OER content, if you're interested in the Creative Commons part of the technology backend, this is the place for you to ask questions. So l let me ask a question from 2020. Sure. Um, I mean, I've been working in and following the open space since uh, about 2000. And one of the big questions always is, how do you get faculty to actually assign these things? Um, I mean, persuading students is a lot easier. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what have you learned from the course of OpenStax? What, what succeeds in convincing faculty members to assign an open like to course? adopt? Yeah. Yeah, to adopt. Well, I, I uh, this, the, yeah, so this, I, I have been involved in this space that's now called Open Educational Resources, but the space of open source meets education, meets authoring, meets publishing for actually just over 20 years, 1999. Mm. So I've learned a lot of lessons uh, uh, along the way. And the, 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 the main lesson that, that I have learned as far as driving adoptions is that, is that you really have to meet you have to meet the adopters, which in this case are the instructors. You have to meet them more than halfway. Uh, what does that mean? Well, what it means, let, let me tell the story. I'll tell it as a story. So when I uh, became involved in this world, it was it was uh, developing a, an initiative called Connections. That some yeah. people out there might know about. Yeah. And which was, uh, the idea was to have a, some kind of digital platform that would allow anyone in the world to be able to generate, you know, to author and then to edit uh, educational materials that could be connected together in a web, right? So to show how ideas are connected in interesting and very useful ways. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's fun that you know, we just hit the 20th anniversary of, of, of connections. Wow. And, uh, but the, the problem was is that the model was too too bleeding edge, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it was it was uh, it was too difficult for say a physics instructor at a university or community college to just adopt this idea as a way of replacing their you know other learning materials. And so the 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 
the pivot or the, the new realization occurred to us in the early 2010, so about 2010, 11. And that was that rather than just building a platform, build it and they will come, we needed to meet faculty more than halfway and we actually needed to start developing our own content. So, uh -huh. so just from talking to hundreds of faculty, we realized that if we didn't have something that was turnkey, that they could replace what they're using now with this new thing, right. it, it was just too difficult because they're too busy, right? Faculty are very, very busy. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why we went into the business, which we hadn't hadn't been up to that point. We were a purely technology project uh, into the business of actually publishing, right? So that's when we renamed the initiative OpenStax in 2012, just to signify this change in thinking uh, around just technology uh, to technology plus content. Does that help? Well, that helps a lot. Um, so yeah. producing the content and getting it there, but then. How do you how do you overcome some of the uh, problems and anxieties faculty face about OER? Either that um, they have a hard time uh, finding the right content for their class, yeah. or they're suspicious of it not being yeah. a good enough quality. I mean, how do you get past that? Yeah. So this was an this is another uh, this is a great question. This was another key sort of realization, right? The trust aspect. Uh, turnkey, so ease is one, trust uh, is another one. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, instead of just saying to instructors, wow, here's a physics text, it was developed using this radical Wikipedia like model, yep. right? Trust it, it's got to be great, right? Uh, we went to, um, we basically took all the best practices of the standard publishing model. Uh, and we applied them with some new, more agile business practices to mm -hmm. lower the cost and the time it takes mm -hmm. to develop the materials. Mm -hmm. But we develop our texts just like a, a standard publisher. You know, we have, there's hundreds of people work on these books. Uh, they, in, in, you know, everyone from, if we're say we're build, building a biology text, top faculty from around the country who are writing the material, Mm. You have copy editors, art program folks, folks generating, you know, thousands of assessments. And, and the goal is really that if an instructor looks at one of our books, they cannot tell the difference to one of the books that is, has been, is being sold for $360 by, you know, one of the big publishers. The big difference, though, is it is exactly $0, right? So that's just, and that required us to go from not a purely community generated content model Sorry. to a venture philanthropy backed content development model. We spend on average about $800,000 per book creating them, mm. right? So that's the investment, but big foundations are willing to pay that cost because they know that the, the return on investment to them, the psychic return on investment is, is currently about 1,400%. So what I mean by that is for every dollar that we bring in to create a book, we're currently saving about 14, students are saving about $14, right? Because they're using free books. Uh, and so we're gonna cross through, sometime this spring, we're gonna cross through a billion dollars in student savings. Wow. Our library, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. So the uh, venture philanthropy plays a, a key role in. Well, absolutely, and just realizing that faculty need to be, yeah, that that they have a lot of, uh, they're extremely busy, and they need to be able to make a, you know, just a choice, but then switch over easier, right, in, in an easier way, not a harder way. Yeah, Ma meeting them more than halfway. Yeah. Um, we have a question that already came in. Uh, this is from Dana Wilkie. So let me flash this on the screen so you all can see it. Are the OERs ADA compliant for online courses? Oh, great, great, uh, great question. Uh, we have a, we have a uh, accessibility team uh, at OpenStax. I should mention that we, we have a staff of about 75. Wow. And we, yeah, we grown from the connections days of six right, to uh, 75, and we 
we are uh, we are definitely at uh, compliant at the uh, the levels that are at, you know absolutely necessary, but we are trying to extend into making our materials even more uh, accessible to an even broader uh, class or groups of uh, students. But I'd be happy to connect you with our our uh, 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 accessibility team if they'd like to uh, if you'd like to dig into that more. Great question. Great question indeed, Dana. Thank you so much. We have to be open for everyone, right? Open for all, not just yeah some small yeah uh, 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 fraction of the education world. Indeed, indeed. Uh, questions have been flying in, and let me just say, um, if you uh, have video camera and microphone available. Just uh, hit the raise hand button and uh, you can ask us questions as well. Uh, so this one just came in from uh, Charlie Doyle, uh, who's a student, who says, I used an OpenStax biology textbook in online course at You of the People. Great book. Will you make textbooks more like a self-study standalone course, like a turnkey MOOC with video lectures? Yeah. Great question. So that's part, definitely part of the, that. The, this goes back to your earlier question mm -hmm. and this... Uh, uh, well, I'll just I'll just answer it. Ab absolutely, that's part of the plan. Uh, however, if we had come out of the gate in 2012, trying to tell instructors uh, who were who were at that time were more thinking about the cost issue, right? My students are having to choose between a $350 book and groceries, right? It's that bad. Uh, if we had told them, oh. Yeah, why don't you instead move to this new uh, futuristic platform that has video lectures and it's all nuggetized and personalized and it's this environment. This, again, we would might have trouble on the trust side of things, right? So our, our goal has always been, uh, well, not always been since the pivot, is that instead of being completely bleeding edge, we need to introduce these new ideas in a more Trojan horse-like way, uh, meaning that we need to have something that instructors are really comfortable with. And that honestly even means selling paper books. If you can believe that, we sell a lot of paper books uh, at like yeah. extremely low cost. But again, it's for partly because there's people who really need those, partly it's because of the trust aspect. Uh, but uh, it is absolutely part of the plan that because all our content, you don't see it when you go look at one of if a PDF file of one of our books, but they're already componentized into learning objects. Uh, they're already mal uh, flexible so you can rearrange them in different ways. Mm. And we've done a number of experiments with ter what, what I, we just colloquially call it the super textbook of where we take a usual OpenStax text and we have embedded in it, uh, you know, video lectures, uh, videos of, fo of folks solving problems in different ways, interactive simulations, uh, all kinds of other uh, uh, activities that students can get involved in. And then with that, we're really just epsilon away from a, what could be a MOOC, right? You really just need the, mm. uh, the uh, uh, sort of learning management system like capacity, right? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely some, a direction that we're, we're moving in. Great question. Well, it's a great question, Charlie. And thank you, uh, uh, Richard, for that really, really rich answer. That's really exciting. Uh, Kate Herzog, uh, librarian, has a question as well. Uh, back to the faculty authors, she says, do your authors realize any credit for their efforts in terms of acquiring tenure? Great question. So. Uh, so our authors, uh, our authors' names go in the book, right? Uh, uh, and and uh, they so that's as far as academic credit, they they would get the same kind of academic credit working on one of our texts as working on a text for one of the big publishers. Uh, one one thing to note is that the textbooks that we've focused on, and and people can click down there on the open stacks button to. To learn more, but we focused on these big intro level, hundred level, like one hundred level intro college courses. Things like calculus, chemistry, physics, psychology, sociology, uh, and those books, by and large, tend tend to be written by a team 
even though there might be one person's name on the front, mm. that these are 1,400 page, mm -hmm. very voluminous mm -hmm. uh, 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 books. And so they tend to be authored, you know, by a team. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you would get the same kind of credit for, with, with your, you know, chair or dean that you would working, you know, with a regular, uh, uh, with a regular publisher. The other difference between our model and other, you know, OER initiatives, and again, back to connections, it was just a completely community driven, let's call it just Wikipedia like approach. Uh, the other thing is that authors actually get paid. So, uh, like I said, we're we're bringing in venture philanthropy to develop these books, and we pay authors for their time. And so, uh, I would I would uh, throw out there that on average, I would bet that our authors at OpenStax actually end up with more money in their pocket than authors who are doing their work speculatively, hoping that they're going to get royalties. Because anyone who's ever written a book knows, or an academic book, is that uh, the promise of royalties often doesn't pay off like, you, uh, like you'd hoped. Well, that's, uh, that's all too often true uh, yeah. in the academic world. But this sounds like a fantastic model. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Kate, for the really, really important question. Yeah. Um, and actually, I've learned something from you, Brian. I love uh, uh, when I ramble, you say I'm being rich. That's excellent. My rich response. Thanks for letting me ramble. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to make a terrible pun on your name. Um, but, no, no, just rich. But when, like but when you ramble, you are you say you're rambling, but you're providing an awful lot of information to people. Um, and uh, if, if you go too far, I'll try and bring you back in. But so Good. far, it's all gold. Um now, you'll see, everybody, that uh, these have been questions so far that uh, folks have been uh, putting through the question window. Uh, let me just put some of them up on video right now to give you sure. how that works. This is our longtime friend of the program and fellow Texan to you, Richard, Tom Haynes. Hello, Tom. Hey. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfectly. Okay. See, I even have the tote bag. Woohoo! Oh, I love it. Oh, That's so good. <laughs> well, uh, no, this is just very useful. Uh, let me... There were three different things that you brought up, and I'll, I'll, I'll let me. I'm looking down at my notes here. Uh, there's, I'll let me cover them in three, yeah, three sort of chapters. So the first is uh, just as far as sustainability. I, I completely agree. The idea here is not to rely on you know foundation support to develop you know all of the books, uh, but if you really actually think about it. Uh, there is enough venture, there's enough foundation support in this country to actually be able to do that or government support, right? Uh, the, the amount for, for something like a hundred something million dollars, you could apply our model to develop a full fleet of college textbooks. That's a tiny amount, uh, a percentage of the entire amount spent every year by students, right? So, okay, but. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep, absolutely. So that said, I'll just tell you a bit about our sustainability model. So when we, and the whole business model behind OpenStax is to, uh, so we create, we take in venture philanthropy, we create these super high quality textbooks, they get adopted widely, but just like open source software, the books, uh, form the core of an ecosystem or a community of companies who work with us in some really innovative ways. So just like a lot of you that use Linux, you actually get it from Red Hat, you're paying for that, right? Because you're getting a value added service and you're actually happy, right? Your schools are happy to do this because they have a 1-800 number to complain to, right? And they have somebody to sue if it doesn't work, right? Yeah, so, so we work with we, in fact, work with Pan Open and some, a, a whole bunch of other companies. And what they do is they wrap a value-added service like tutoring or fancy e-textbook or some other distribution model around our books. Uh, and then they market that. So that has two effects. One is that it really helps get the word out about OpenStax. So the areas where we have really taken off fastest is where there are a lot of computer-based homework systems that are 
using OpenStax. Companies like WebAssign, Sapling Learning. Uh, so that's taken us to over 50% market share in those in, in the college physics market, right? Wow. Through these partners. But the other thing is when they make a sale of one of their inexpensive products around our our books, they actually revenue share back to us. So so, so we don't ask the foundations to to create to help us curate the books or create second and third editions because we have we're already economically sustainable on the, the 38 books we've created. Mm. Right? So we have enough funds coming in to be able to pay to pay for that. And what our models point to the fact that if we can get to, you know, close to 100 books that we're going to hit, it's like a nuclear reaction, right? We're going to hit critical mass that the amount of revenue that's coming in will actually now allow us to just accelerate and create more and more books. Oh, wow. So, so that's really the, the model. Um, and, and secondly, around, well, actually there's four chaps. Secondly, around creating second editions, there's, remember these are open source. And so there's a tremendous community that gets built around each of these books wow. that, that work. At, you know, that's the whole point, right? Is that you want to build this community, not just have kids, save money, you want both. Mm. So I'll give an interesting example, and this is really going rich in my uh, uh, answering here. Uh, here's a really interesting example of the open source nature of these books. So I don't know how many of you are chemists, chemistry instructors, but we have a chemistry book. Uh, it's a nice book uh, and it's used in a lot of places. And University of Connecticut, okay, the students, Increasingly, it's students who are going to their faculty saying, hey, do you know about these OpenStax books? Well, the chemistry students went to the uh, chemistry faculty at UConn and said, hey, uh, why are you making us buy this $350 chemistry textbook when there's this really nice OpenStax book that's free? And the faculty had a actually completely uh, good reason for this. They said, because you know what? There's two ways to teach chemistry. As far as matter, there's kind of a bottom up way and a top down way. And at, at UConn, we like atoms, we teach the bottom up way. We teach about atoms first and then matter later. And the open and the open stacks book does it the other way. Because that's most schools in the country do it. Matter first, atoms later. So yeah. We can't use their book. Well, that's too bad. Students were disappointed. They went back, scratched their head, realized the book was open source. They took a collection, okay? The students raised $20,000, their own money, $20,000. Wow. And then they went to us and said, can you take this money and get some chemists to create the other book based on what you have? And in fact, we could. It took us uh, six months. We created this new book. Not only is UConn using it, but it is so good, this book, that if you go to our our, our library, we yeah. actually publish that as one of our canonical texts now, right? So it's actually a community that was the community's idea. It was essentially developed by this community. And and so that I think is the, the power of this this open source model, right? That's gonna be able to allow us to create, you know, just a tremendously more what I'm going to use the word rich, but a rich <laughs> environment of resources. Okay. So I don't want to ramble too much. So that's sustainability. The other one is, you know, that I, I always use this word textbook and book, but it's a metaphor. You have to have a metaphor, right? We're talking about learning materials. Mm. All our, all of our open stacks books are little learning objects. You just don't see it. You don't see it because uh, most faculty don't, they're just starting to get that, right? There's a cutting edge people get it. But, but you know, we I worked for 10 years in this learning object space, right? And it's just so complicated. And that, you have to be aware of the chasm. I don't know if you read the book, Crossing the Chasm. Sure, sure. Connections is on the wrong side of the chasm. OpenStax is on the big, you know, the big bell curve side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so. So, so, so that's one thing. The other thing, though, is that these, you know, we did this for a decade. Con quality content does not emerge from the primordial soup of ideas. It just doesn't. OK, a bunch of faculty don't just get together and write books. Right. 
they might write a collection of really nice learning materials, mm -hmm. but there's no narrative thread. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like saying, hey, if you need to learn calculus, use Wikipedia as your calculus textbook. It just doesn't work, right? You don't, that, it's just, you need that narrative that ties everything to, together. Uh, and so, and we've kind of seen this, this is kind of my, you know, going out on my, on, a, on a ledge here, but the thing that was really hot five, through a few years ago was Z degree. Yeah. Yeah. Faculty are going to develop these books. It just didn't work. Right. And when it did work, one school built a book, but it was so specific. It didn't work anywhere else. Right. So anyway, I, 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 this is a, this is a space I would love to see more progress in. Right. But for right now, we're, because we're trying to, we're trying to really focus on students and helping more students get access to, to these high quality learning opportunities. We're, we're more leading with the free, even though what we really believe and the future is, is open. Okay. That's, that's two things. Now last, you brought up a point that I think is incredibly important and everybody on this call needs to know about this and you need to go talk to your administrators about this. And that is everything that we believe in, everything that we have been working towards, right? Free and open access for students, uh, open access, open source models so faculty can have academic freedom, right? To be able to, to make the material their own, customize it, make it perfect for their course. This is under a big threat today, okay? A big threat. And it's because the big publishers have figured out that this is going to eat their lunch, okay? And that this is putting a tremendous stress on their business models. And so they're trying to co-opt this movement with, with ideas that sound really good, like they sound uh, inclusive access, right? But we're not, oh, that sounds great. It's so inclusive. And it is extraordinarily dangerous because it is anti-academic freedom. There, It's trying to uh, hide the cost of the materials in student fees, for example. And it doesn't let students opt out. It's basically trying to kill the used books, book type market, the rental market, uh, other open initiatives. And uh, it, it's, it's funny, when I talk to university presidents and provosts about this, they're just incredible. Their eyes open wide because they say that's not what that we were told when we bought into this. Right. Uh, and so this is something that uh, OpenStax and and you know uh, organizations like Spark and other yeah. open educational uh, 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 folks are are starting to take really seriously because we could see a backslide on all of this great progress that's been made over the last few years. So. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but just remember that that's the beauty of open sourcedness is that you can create, you know, the best, you know, Brian can say, just make the best book for his course because it's open, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. That's great. That's great to hear, actually. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and for everybody else, if you're new to the forum, this is uh, you can see how easily the uh, video uh, session works. And um, Richard, thank you uh, for really, really diving into uh, Tom's questions and, and pulling them apart. I, I just want to say for everybody who hasn't seen this yet, if you go to the um, OpenStax site, the uh, uh, chemistry textbooks, you have covers. One says chemistry, second edition, and one says chemistry, Adams first. Mm -hmm. You can see that there. 
Uh, we have a question here from uh, from Vic, uh, Vic Vucic or Vucic. Hello, Vic. Vic. Hey, Rich. Long time. <laughs> Can I just say before Vic says anything that we wouldn't be here without Vic Vucic, and he wow. was one of the key people at Hewlett Foundation who really believed in us and believed in this model. So great to hear from you, Vic. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. It's one of my proudest grants I made. Oh, great, great to hear. Great to hear where everything is growing and booming. I got two questions for you. We'll keep oh. it quick. Um, do you have any mechanism or way, do you guys check the pricing of your partners and, and to kind of make sure that your partners aren't taking what you're doing and then oh, Great question. Okay. Uh, and then the second quick one is, are you guys thinking about K-12 at all moving into um, or kind of AP or the bridge? Uh, yeah, great K question. So first is, yes, we do check. Now, of course, we don't have, uh, uh, you know, we don't have it built into our contracts that, that that's one way you could do it is, 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 is have a, a licensing agreement where they had to, uh, where a company couldn't be exploitive. The good news is, is it just that hasn't happened so far. So we haven't done that. Uh, and let me just step back and, and explain why we would even have a licensing agreement, right? Because everything's open source. So uh, companies, uh, because, our, we, because we use the most open CC uh, Creative Commons license, the CC BY license, mm. uh, companies are well, you know, they're free and welcome to take our content and put it into their platforms. The thing that 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 is that we keep proprietary though to OpenStax is the brand, right? Our logo and our brand, because that's really the thing that people trust. It's now yeah. now faculty are starting to know. Wow, it's an OpenStax resource. Mm. They've got all of these. Uh, I've I've looked at the you know they have this whole library. This 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 has got to be great stuff, right? So so we actually. Uh, have to we get actually sign a licensing agreement for that, and that that is some way we could in, enforce it, right? So that's one. That's a really great point. So second is about K twelve, and this is this is uh, uh this is an industry K twelve publishing industry dwarfs the college publishing industry, uh, and so this is an area of of uh, great interest to us. Um, I'll just point out that. Even though we have been laser focused on intro college textbooks, and we have about uh, almost four million students using our books this this school year, ten percent of those students are K twelve students. They're high school students, and they're and this is because even though we do no marketing in K twelve, so uh, they're coming for a number of reasons. One is, and I don't just mean students who go to our site. I mean real adoptions. Mm. That our book is the book they're using. So it's it's a number of uh, directions. One is AP. We have a number of advanced placement textbooks, uh, physics, biology, uh, economics, uh, and these are becoming very popular. So advanced placement, dual credit is becoming more and more popular. So more and more of our mm. co just straight ahead college books are being used in high school. Uh, so that's great momentum. Everybody always asks about K-12. We're very interested. We actually do have a K-12 director now, uh, but the, we need to get it right, right? We got to get the plan right. It's got to be at the right time, the right kind of level. And I, we'd be very interested in, uh, you know, thoughts or comments from folks, uh, you know, about that. Does that help, Vic? Thank you. Super helpful. Yeah. And thanks again. Well, thank you. And thank you, Vic, for the question as well as for the grant. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a whole stack of questions coming in. Uh, and let me quickly flash a few of the text questions up. Uh, this is one from, let's say, this is from Charles Findlay from Northeastern who asks, is there a problem with alignment with existing texts, such as the legal action of oh. the boundless? Yes, boundless. Who remembers boundless? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I won't go into the, all the problems Boundless had because you could see from the very beginning that there was going to be a problem there. Uh, the good news. Okay. So if you look at one of, let's say if you choose our chem, look at our chemistry text 
and compare it to uh, a, a publisher textbook, it will look very similar. What we call the scope and sequence. Mm -hmm. The sequence of topics will be similar and the you know topics and how they're covered will be similar. But that's because if you look at, compare any two publisher texts, they're gonna look similar. And that's because, again, this point that was brought up, brought up earlier, there's just a uniformity or and a standardization across the country of how that of a, just a standard way to teach a lot of these courses. And so we just follow that same uh, standard scope and sequence. But there's no, we don't need to, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not going in there like Boundless was and trying to actually sort of recreate a publisher text. Yeah, we, you don't need to do that. You just need to be a chemistry instructor and know the standard way that is taught when you become an author. So great question. Yeah, good question indeed. Yeah. Uh, and we have um, a question from uh, Fred Bashirs. A couple of questions from him. And here's a quick Hello, Fred. I know Fred. How are you? Fred is awesome. He asks, how do you deal with student information? Oh, good point. Uh, you mean student data and all of that kind of stuff? I think so. Yes. So uh, we, so the, we, okay. Well, in the, until recently, we didn't actually have accounts. So uh, you would just go to the open state. So there was no student information. Mm, uh, mm. It was, um, uh, yeah, you would just basically uh, come to our website or download a PDF file. Now that we have tools on the web version of our books, like highlighting, uh, we have a really nice highlighting tool where you can, uh, you know, customize your book uh, uh, and then share those highlights with other students. We do have student accounts. And so we're, Mm -hmm. uh, we're basically working with, you know, leading privacy folks and data, uh, uh, data security folks to make sure that we uh, protect that student data uh, to the fullest extent uh, possible. Um, and this is where another space, I think, where we're really excited by playing a leadership role because we're not a for-profit entity and we're based at a major university. We want to wear the widest of widest brimmed white hats in this mm. space, mm. Uh, so that we uh, are 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 uh, really thinking about students again, thinking about students first, and that not only includes just access to learning, but also pr uh, protecting their their data. So, great question. Well, it is indeed, uh, yeah. and uh, thank you for it, and thank you for that really really clear answer, Rich. We have a, another question um, that's another video question, and this is from a longtime uh, supporter and friend of the uh, program. This is from uh, Roxanne Riskin, who is actually from the Yukon area. Yeah. And uh, Roxanne, hello. Hi, Ryan and Kitty and um, Spider. Yes, that's yeah. him. Hi. Um, thank you so much for working with Yukon. I'm very, very happy to hear that. That's fantastic. And just one other one other question about UConn. Any other um, universities in Connecticut that have? Uh, well, if you go to the OpenStax website and you uh, there's a button to uh, push to get the full list of adopters. So oh, I guess everybody go check that out. Uh, if yeah. there's, I, I th there should also be a map adoption map, which is very fun to explore. Yeah. Uh, if it's not there, it just means that it's coming in like the next few weeks. But uh, I definitely we're actually at uh, close to, um, yes, uh, well over 7,000 institutions across the country. Yeah, so that's fantastic. We're at about 62% of all colleges and universities around the country. Wow. Well, I, I um, worked at Fairfield University Library and I was. Um, at one of the first OpenStax or OER uh, launches we had many years ago. And exactly. um, there was quite um, a lot of interest and quite a lot of um, curiosity about how, uh, how we bring librarians and faculty together to yes. these um, important resources for students. And what do you see as the primary role for the librarian and um, mm. Also, um, I, I have another another one that really doesn't match up with that one, but 
Well, can I answer that yeah. first? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, so librarians have been our friends from the beginning. Very important people. Um, so we have had uh, close ties with Spark uh, for eighteen years, um, and uh, have worked closely with librarians and have some of our marketing campaigns and institutional partnership programs are actually the leads of those that the various institutions are actually in the, in the library because it really is the nexus information nexus so um i would say you know long long term the i see a shift in the way that that students think about obtaining materials uh, you know, the things that they use outside of class as, as shifting from the bookstore to the library, right? That's really what needs to happen mm -hmm. uh, because the bookstore is really there, you know, every, think back, right? It's the place where the big stacks of paper books are stored and, and picked up and paid for, right? But things really need to move to the library. And I think the thing that the library brings that is so much more than a bookstore, in the bookstore, a student is a customer, but in a library, a student is a community member. And again, think of open the open source aspect of all of this, right? The whole idea is to build these communities around the content. And librarians are the natural curators of all of this, right? I think it's just tremendously exciting uh, for, you know, for the future, right? Uh, and and once, once everything becomes digital, once more and more things become open source, and we, you know, move to a world where instructors are really making a lot of improvements and changes. Mm. Those have to be looked after, right? And discovered by other people. And that's really what librarians are great at. So I think it's like a new golden age of, of libraries. Do you see the faculty members as the, as the important, having the important role of reaching out to the librarians or is it a collaboration between both library and faculty members, because a lot of faculty members are very wary um, sometimes of adopting an OER yeah. resource. Yeah. I'm in an applied ethics class right now as yeah. a, a lifelong learner and uh, at Fairfield U, and the book cost me a fortune. Oh. <laughs> and I bought a used book. And, yeah. I, oh, and I saw right. your ethics book out the, uh, yeah. uh, online, but um, I, I need an, uh, an applied ethics book. Yeah, so, yeah. So. Why well, you need your faculty member to customize yeah. ours, right? Mm. I yeah. So I, 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 to so me, it's a two way street. Decide, oh, oh, sorry. So I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, how do you decide which books? This is leading me to uh, another question. How do you decide which books are next to be um, oh, um, published? Yeah, good point. Good point. So the, the model, uh, the, the model for the first 40 or so books was really around um, what we called like an impact factor. Hmm. And this was combined two, combined two figures. One was, you know, recall again, the whole point of OpenStax is to help students, right? And so there's no point, there's, la there's more, there's no point helping students in a course where the m learning materials cost $25. Well, not that there's no point, but there's less of a reason than a course where students are paying $250. Mm -hmm. So what we looked at were these courses where there were both very large numbers of students. A great example is psychology, right? Psychology 100, 101. There's a million students take that course every year. Uh, and then where those million students are having to pay a lot for a book. So a, a psychology book is, you know, often $200. So, so if you look at our, if you look at the catalog that we have, by and large, it's all these big courses like chemistry and statistics mm -hmm. and psychology. So, so, uh, so the, as we're developing out, though, there's a few more of those that we need to develop. But the next phase is actually moving into developing degree programs, like or what we call like a vertical stack of books that would allow you to get, for example, an entire business degree or at least like an, at least an associate's business degree, say, never having to spend a dollar on a textbook. And so we, we've actually launched one of those in business. Uh, Entrepreneurship just published last week. There's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a curriculum or like a, a vertical of six textbooks. 
And we're planning a number of others of those so that we can hit not just the gen ed texts, but also the highest enrolled uh, degree programs around the country. Wow. That's that innovative. Help? That's that's ex that's extremely innovative. Um, also, the other question or the third question, I guess I had was, how do you integrate the books with the LMS? Oh, is great question. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, okay. this is much more. It's much harder than it sounds. Uh, one would think if you just you know put things into a con certain container and pop it in, mm -hmm. and and you'd also think there's only about two or three dominant LMSs in the country. The problem is is that Canvas is not Canvas is not Canvas. Every oh. Every school seems to have a slightly different implementation of, say, Canvas or Blackboard or mm -hmm. uh, some of these other uh, learning management yeah. systems. And so, uh, so one of the things that we have been doing is working. So it turns out it's fairly complicated, mm -hmm. uh, and that means it's costly, mm -hmm. right? And we're all about lowering costs and scaling. So we're we're still trying to crack that nut in the best possible way. But in the meantime, one of the things that we've been doing is working with one of our partners is a company called Willow Labs, who are a LMS facilitator. So if, if some of the schools who are big adopters of many of our textbooks, they can work with Willow Labs to very easily have them be pulled into the LMS. Mm. That said, faculty are already you know, just doing it, right? They're either linking from our the web view of our books from their LMS or they're pulling the PDF of the book into their LMS. But this is an area that we could really use a more, I think, principled, uh, easy solution. Be beautiful if you could just push a button. Yeah, yeah because LMS, the LMS isn't going away anytime soon. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And absolutely needs a revision. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> the next gen LMS really can't come fast enough. Yeah. Well, you're going to build this one. I am? <laughs> okay. I need Tom. <laughs> I need Tom and Brian. <laughs> we, all, we all need you. Hard to follow Tom. He's pretty awesome. <laughs> thank you for the great questions. Thank, oh, thank you, you so much. much. Um, Richard, I, I, I hate to say it, but we're out of time. Um, it's been fun. It's been rich. <laughs> it, it it's been rich with rich. Um, we have, um, uh, I, I just want to say, I'm so thankful for all the, all the uh, really detailed answers that you've, 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 you've taken every question very, very seriously. And I, I, really oh, I learn, I'm interrupting you, but that's how you learn. I mean, I've learned so much from everybody today. So I agree. I, so much. Uh, quick question. How can we all keep up with you? What's the best way? Well, the best way is just to keep coming back to openstacks.org. And if you were on Facebook, all the usual social media outlets, mm -hmm. and there's a pretty active blog that will give you the you know, updates on exciting goings on. And so you can just sign up, uh, sign up for that too. Very nice. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to follow up. And when you cross the $1 billion mark, please let us know so we can show I'll do it. I'll do it. Thanks again. Thanks so much for the invitation, and we'll see everybody. We'll see you soon. But don't go away, everybody. Uh, we have to point out what's happening over the next week. And let me just thank you all for that fantastic series of questions. Uh, next week, somehow, it's February 6th, and also the fourth anniversary of the start of the Future Transform. And we'll have two fantastic guests, Lene Erickson and Robert Kelchin. Lene is from the Third Way Think Tank, and Robert Kelchin is from uh, Seton Hall University. And they're going to be discussing a really powerful, powerful question about policy, trying to look at how Congress could link federal funding to student completion rates in higher education. Uh, this is a great, great topic, and these are fantastic people. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we also have videos up of a past Future Trend Forum sessions. Uh, if you just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, you can pull those down. If you want to keep talking about this, we're continuing to have conversations, especially on Twitter, but also on Slack and LinkedIn and on uh, Facebook. So please go to those sources. In the meantime, keep thinking about this great stuff. We'll see you online next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>